Welcome, I'm uh, David Feller. I run uh, product management and we call it solutions engineering. That's all the field solutions architects uh, for Spectrologic. If you're not familiar with Spectrologic, I got a really pretty picture. I, I think it was more of an excuse to let our uh, facilities guy buy a drone. We're out of, uh, we're out of Boulder, Colorado. Uh, and those are the beautiful Rocky Mountains right outside our window. Uh, 40 years old, we've got about 20,000 installations worldwide, very heavily invested in high performance computing, media and entertainment, oil and gas, finance, um, and we're a privately held company. 40 years old uh, this year actually, so it's uh, our founder uh, started the company out of his uh, dorm room at University of Colorado, which you can't quite see, but we're, he hasn't moved far from his origins. Uh, it, by the way, it doesn't look like that right now. It's completely covered in snow and my wife is really irritated because I've now missed the fourth big snowstorm of the year and she's shoveling the driveway without me. <laughs> so uh, as, as most companies, we've, we've got a great heritage in the HPC space, uh, serve most of the major uh, big, big data labs. Uh, most of the folks that you've seen on the benchmark uh, have our library or our disk or something behind it. Uh, we are a tier two storage company, so we usually don't show up on the primary, uh, you know, I IO benchmarks, but uh, uh, really good business for us. Um, I'm gonna, we're gonna talk about two or three specific installations and some of the, the issues that they've run into, some of the solutions, and in fact, uh, what are the hints as to what does that mean for HPC in general? Where are things headed uh, and, and what, what can we take from some of these more recent installations? But just as a quick uh, overview, what are these products that we are offering to the customers so that you'll know what they mean when you see them on the diagrams? Uh, we are traditionally a tape library company. We've been doing that for a long time. It's been a great business. Uh, we make all the way from you know small units, you, you start with 6U, 40 slots, all the way up to the big daddy here that or big mama, either way, is uh, more than, that's probably really bad, um, uh, over two exabytes in a single machine and very fast. Um, we can get up to 300 gigabytes per second or so with, with uh, clusters of these, so uh, very impressive machine. We also do disk storage. These are just bulk NAS, so it's, it's tier two bulk NAS, SIFS NFS, a low cost starts at 10 cents a gig or so, but it's really an amazing product. It's a ZFS underneath uh, with FreeBSD. So it's, you get an enterprise grade storage uh, product with a very simple interface on top. But a lot of what we're gonna talk about are some of the new uh, trends in HPC that are around sharing or around multi-site. Uh, you know, installations like CERN and others have showed us that uh, sharing your data center, distributing your data center is really critical you know, how is that really being done? It's being done by overlaying typically an object store on top of a traditional archive system underneath. And we'll talk about how those pieces work. Um, I just show this because it's cool. The, the main machine starts at three frames all the way up to 44, holds over 53,000 slots, over two exabytes of data. And why is it cool? It's, it's actually a robot. There's two robots inside. And as we all know, robots are cool, no matter what. Um, and we put great pictures on the front. so. You know, they become kind of the center of a, a data center tour frequently. Um, uh, there's some of them we're allowed to show. We just did a couple for some of the uh, atomic research labs and whatever it is, picture they put on the front was classified and I can't show it to anybody, but it's an amazing picture. So let's talk about a couple of installations. Uh, this one's actually a few years old, um, but was one of the first ones to uh, jump into what, what I would consider some new trends in HPC that are really fascinating. So this is NCSA out of uh, University of Illinois, up in Champaign. Uh, it's a Cray installation for uh, the compute cluster, um, but behind it, uh, there's a pretty significant archive, four of our big Tfinity machines. Um, and look at that number, that's a really fascinating number uh, from a throughput standpoint. Most people, when you think about archive, you don't think about things in the gigabytes per second. That particular machine's capable, capable of up to 60 or so gigabyte per second, um, and we've got machines that are significantly faster than that as well. So speed is certainly changing, and, and what the capability into an archive system uh, is, is really growing as well. The other piece, I unfairly highlighted it in yellow there, um, is this need and this trend to have a shared archive. Now, sharing can mean more than one thing. It can mean sharing within a department or it can mean multi-site sharing. Um, but NCSA has also implemented an object store that sits on top of that archive system to enable sharing. So let's jump into Vanderbilt, which was kind of the, the headliner, beyond it being a very uh, good-looking machine. Uh, it sits as part of the ACCRE 
uh, Center. So that's part of the uh, Vanderbilt University Research uh, Computing Center. They share that particular supercompute cl platform with uh, 50 research groups. There's six schools that all share it. Um, relatively small to start with, 10,000 cores, a very nice GPU uh, installation as well. They wrote their own file system, uh, LSTOR. Uh, as if you're from a university, everybody wants to write their own uh, parallel file system because everybody can do it better than the next one. Um, Vanderbilt actually did a very nice job. It's, uh, they haven't reached the limit yet of what the ingest rate is based on what their equipment is. Um, it's a very nice, uh, very well-designed uh, file system. Um, they've gone 100 gig as the uh, primary backbone. The workflow is pretty straightforward, and I'll call a few things to your attention. Users on the left, compute cluster in the middle. Uh, you might be surprised how many data centers we walk into that actually don't have a backup system. Uh, quite a few of the major universities, their, uh, uh, their, their, their main cache system or uh, is not backed up in any way. So uh, Vanderbilt implemented with Pterodactyl a very nice backup system that um, creates multiple copies based, uh, based on usage. Um, so they really pioneered some, some new things that were going on there. On the right side, you'll see again the sharing concept, um, direct user access and interdepartment sharing. So this is a new trend, um, and it's made uh, possible by essentially adding an object store layer on top of archive. In this particular case, uh, there's two distinct needs for that sharing that are a little bit different than you, you when you start thinking about sharing. One is uh, to share the equipment. So if I'm installing an archive uh, a cluster, if you will, very similar to uh, University of Cambridge over in the UK, um, has also implemented a very similar architecture where um, they've invested the money in an, in, in an archive, um, but by overlaying an object store on top of that, they can become essentially a, a, a restful interface share to the rest of the part departments on campus. The, dirty secret of that is it allows them to then back bill all those other departments on campus and, and share part of the expenses. The other part is uh, a true multi-site sharing. So as we've seen with most of the uh, more recent HPC installations, it's not really just about uh, you know the archive at that particular location. Uh, the variety of uh, Bay Area HPC centers are heavily involved in uh, you know, university research, but by the time uh, that experiment is done and that professor or grad student or whatever it is has moved on while they're writing the, the, the papers, they may need five or 10 year access to their data. So how do you provide that, uh, that in a way that's really ambivalent of what their location is? They don't, we wanna be able to provide access, uh, restful kind of access to data even if those researchers are, are, are physically moved on to some other place, perhaps somewhere else in the world. So that's a, a driving factor. Um, we did ask um, Vanderbilt in particular, well, why did you even choose Spectra? Uh, we're, we're heavily innovating as well on the tape side. So uh, tape is still a huge investment for us. We, we put 20-ish uh, percent of our R&D uh, into, into new tape research as well. Um, we do really cool things like TerraPacks. We move nine, ten tapes around at a time. Makes it really efficient to uh, robotically move tapes to and from uh, tape drives. Um, but we're also doing some cool things like driving an Ethernet connectivity. Uh, it, if it's not clear, most connectivity to tape drives today is fiber channel. Very frequently, that's one of the last places people are using fiber channel in data centers. So we're trying to get rid of that. Uh, driving Ethernet uh, connectivity right to LTO drives. Um, also uh, pioneering in cooperation with folks like HPSS, DMF, uh, the, the data mover in and out of the archive, uh, a new technology, we call it TAUS, which is a way to um, enhance small file recovery. So we do predictive algorithms of where those particular objects are on tape so that we can get them back very efficiently. You imagine tape is a very linear kind of a product. And if I uh, were to ask for random things uh, off of that tape and I do it in a bad order, I can spend a lot of time forwarding and reversing. So we came up with a very clever technology that's implemented in the library that makes small, pi small file performance better. So we talked about that sharing technology real quick, high level. This object store technology that we offer, it's just an appliance. Um, there's no licensing involved. RESTful interface on top, policy-based 
uh, uh, storage underneath. So the admin can say, hey, I want a copy on uh, tape. Maybe I want two copies on tape, maybe 20. We like selling lots of storage. Um, or, or I want a, also a copy on disk for some period of time, or uh, all holds barred, let's put a copy in the cloud somewhere. So that's not always appropriate for every workflow, um, but we have a single appliance that takes care of doing all of that. So I don't know if you guys have seen the graphics. This is the, uh, from the Storage 2020 NERSC slash uh, Lawrence Berkeley paper that they put out, uh, I guess it was last year. Um, taking a look at what are the trends that are going on in the HPC space. Uh, this is actually their implementation of four tiered approach, which absolutely gives the best bang for the buck uh, from a, a trade off of performance and cost. Nobody yet has invented uh, anything that is the top performing uh, storage product that's also the lowest cost, so hence the tiers. Um, but tiers are uh, problems. Uh, it, it's a lot of manual labor, it, it's expensive, and as we all know, HSMs don't always perform quite as advertised. Um, so having multiple tiers causes us all troubles. So I, I think what the industry is headed towards, and we agree with the paper and have seen evidence of this, you'll, you'll see these in the, uh, the examples that we went over before, is that uh, the number of tiers uh, that are being installed in the latest data centers is, is coming down. So it tends to be two. You know, high performance file system, POSIX interface, uh, something that, that's really driven for performance, but a lower tier, we call it a perpetual storage tier. Uh, it's essentially the lower level archive. The paper calls it uh, community storage, campaign storage, but a lower tier. And there's new characteristics in these lower tiers. Um, one of them certainly is speed. So as, as we have less tiers, I need those tiers to perform better. So we're driving into performance that is in hundreds of gigabytes per second capability for that uh, perpetual tier, while at the same time providing uh, a really unique opportunities for sharing. And that's typically done because it's an object store or RESTful interface underneath. And I, th I think you'll see that replicated over and over and over in the, uh, the more modern data centers. So I'll leave you with a, a few straightforward predictions. Uh, we actually write a, a, a state of storage paper every year. I'm pretty sure it's on our website, but talk to the guys at the booth if you want a copy. That goes through what's getting stored, how much is getting stored, uh, disk, tape, flash, what's the balance between them, and wh what are we really seeing as far as trends go. Really, really high level, I don't know if you guys have seen the uh, IDC number of they claim by 2025, it'll be 160 zettabytes of data. Uh, yes, we're not going to store it all. That's just ridiculous. Um, processing, dedupe, you know, all the great capabilities out there means we don't have to store that much data. Doesn't mean storage isn't a great market. Um, tiering essentially will continue. There'll be a lot of multi-site sharing, a lot of cloud assist technologies. Uh, I can't tell you how many places we've walked in and, and they said, oh, the cloud is not for me. I will never use the cloud. My data, it's not right for the cloud. And then the next time you go in, they're using the cloud, right? So, so um, the, the, the really interesting part, our vision is that uh, the cloud is good, not just for storage, but for those processing pieces to allow cloud assist as well. So the cloud is gonna make your local data center work better, more efficiently, and be more easily monitored. So you'll see lots of great products coming from a variety of companies that address that. Uh, one of the last things in the middle, if it's not clear, uh, tape continues to be a really good business, certainly for us. All of the uh, more recent HPC installations, it's either us or IBM, typically in those installations. Um, and tape has, has, continues to be a really great cost leader. The lowest cost right now is a technology called LTO7M. You get nine terabytes on an LTO7 cartridge and it works out to about a quarter of a penny a gigabyte. So that's a very compelling number. Drives a lot of uh, purchasing decisions one way or other based around that. But air gap is another big thing. This whole concept of how do I protect my data how do I make sure that uh, you know, malware and things don't affect me? Well, the only way to truly do that is to have an offline copy, and uh, tape certainly provides that. Um, in this paper uh, that we write, we're looking at what the overall costs are. You've seen a lot of flash presentations today and uh, what the future of that technology is. We're expecting flash costs to come down by half in this calendar year. 
um, driven certainly by technology. You saw some really amazing things today and how we stack up uh, you know, Flash to make it more efficient, but also just by supply constraints. So we're expecting that to, to be quite the breakthrough and allow Flash into some other markets that traditionally it has not played in, for instance, some of the disk markets as well. So um, we do have a booth over in the other area. I'd love to share more of uh, our insights of where HP is, HPC is headed and how Spectra plays there. But hopefully you've seen a, a couple of interesting things that are playing faster speeds, less tiers, and a lot more sharing going on between the HPC labs. And we're trying to enable that with our products. Thank you. Can you, can you explain a little bit more about what you mean by RESTful interface? Oh, you bet. I'm sorry, I should have, I should have said that more. Um, so we, along with many other vendors, have standard around, standardized around Amazon's S3 interface that you use to store data on the web. Turns out it's very efficient and it's really great at uh, long delays. Uh, tape is one of those technologies where it could be anywhere from a minute to an hour before you get the first byte. So having a technology that's you know, HTTP RESTful, it's okay with those, those long delays, is really good for an archive if you've got a, a, a layer behind it like tape. I think somebody mentioned before there's, uh, there's a big push, and we're part of it, of putting uh, disk layers and fast layers in front of tape to hide some of those things that go on with tape in the background. But that RESTful interface, uh, that object store makes everything easier when you're talking about a long-term archive. Um, I can't help but ask you about your quarter of a penny a gigabyte. Is that, are we projecting that or is that something that you see today? We're, we're, we're just about there today. An LTO7, if you calculate an LTO7 tape, that's just a, com the that's tape. a compressed number. Right. That's a compressed number. So LTO7 uh, native is six. LTO 7M, so if you take an LTO 8 drive and you put an LTO 7 tape in it, you get nine terabytes. That extra three is free, basically, because you bought the LTO 7 tape. You would have had to invest in the LTO 8 drive, but they're only a little bit more. Um, and the drives have both compression and encryption built in, so the industry uses a two and a half X compression built in, so nine becomes 18, somebody do that math for me, 25. So if you did but divide the, out, but that's that what doesn't happens. that only is for the, the actual. It's just for the tape. tape. Yeah, okay. but if you look at the if we look at scale, um, the cost of the library, the cost of the equipment, just almost pales out in comparison to the media cost. So whether you're talking about this, very frequently what we're talking about is the second copy becomes a quarter of a penny, and if you're going to factor in the first copy, uh, a large library goes anywhere from you know we have an entry level at. $10,000 all the way up to a million for a, uh, or more for one of the larger libraries. But if you fill it with media, it's 10x that cost. Okay. All right. Well, well. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Thanks again, David. Let's move on.